Well, today, I want to talk about having learned all we've learned, and I know we've still got some things to learn this week in our Connect group, and a memory verse to, to learn. Um, but today, I want to, as to uh, look at how can we maintain what we've already started? How can we keep on keeping on? Because we don't want to just to do something for a short period of time and then it be something that we never touch or go back to again or very rarely. <clears throat> I think it's important that we keep on developing the habits that we've been learning through these 40 days. For all of us, we've not mastered them. We have just learnt about them and had a little bit of practice. It's, uh, the aim is for us now, throughout the next weeks, months, possibly years of our life, whatever God gives us, um, that we can continue to grow and develop in the Word of God. Amen. Jesus said this, If you continue in my Word, then you're really my followers, then you're my disciples. He didn't say, if you do it for 40 days and stop, that's all that matters. He said, if you continue, that's an ongoing, participle of an ongoing thing that needs to be happening, not just daily, but throughout the day. So that the scripture that God is speaking to you about in the morning is you are talking to him through it all day long. You are continuing in the word of God. So it's when you continue in his word that you are his disciple. And I believe that's important for us. So how do we integrate God's word into every area of our life? Well, the word integrate is the opposite of segregate. Segregate is putting things into, into parts. We separate them into, into groups. But integrate means that we don't live a separated life. What I've learned is it's so easy to live a compartmentalized life than to live an integrated life that God wants us to do, a life of integrity. Integrity comes from the word in. Integrated. It means that to have integrity means that your life is in one compartment. You are not one thing with one group of people and different with another group of people. You're not one thing at work and another thing, uh, you know, in the home. Not one thing in your connect group and another thing at work. Do you know what I'm trying to say? Or another thing at your hobby. So people are seeing different versions of you. To be a man or woman of integrity to a man or woman who has the word of God living and breathing within them is uh, someone who is actually living a life whereby every aspect of their life is integrated, it joined up, it is all the same, yes? So whether that's your personal life, your church life, your business life, your home life, your social life, it all needs to go together. If you're living with compartmental life, it means that you lack integrity. And so it's important that we act the same everywhere. Uh, the first verse in your outline today is out of Psalm 119 and verse 20 in the contemporary English version. It says that, what I want most of all, what I want most of all. In other words, what is going to be the number one priority in my life, what do you want most of all? What is the craving and desire of your heart? David says, what I want most of all, and at all times, in other words, an integrated life all the time, not just some of the time, not just on Sunday mornings, not just on midweek meetings, not just whatever it might be, a family at home, but we says there is to honor your laws. That was David's cry. What I want most of all at all times is to honor your laws. In other words, David says, I want to be a man of your word. 
So in other words, we want to be people of the word in every sphere of our life. I know because it's so easy to act differently in one sphere than it is in another because there are certain expectations that culture puts on you in certain settings. And you might be in a work setting where the culture is one thing, but when you're at home, you're living a different culture. And so it's so easy to do that. Well, today I want to go through six very simple steps of us to know how to live an integrated life, how to keep on keeping on, how to be a man or woman of the word of God. And these six steps are the very six Bible verses that we have been learning over the past six weeks. Yes, so that's, you'll notice that from your outline, you'll be able to see the memory verses that you have learned. And so if you'll memorize these six verses and begin to build your life around them, it will transform your life. You will become a man or a woman of God. You see, these verses teach us how to take the Bible and build on it, feed on it, live by it, grow through it, act on it, and trust in it. So let's look at the first of these six verses. I haven't done them in order, but, uh, but the six are there. The first thing to do to become a man or woman of the word is you must build your life on it. Yes, In other words, you must make it the foundation of your life. Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7, which was our week five memory verse, last week's memory verse, he says this, everyone who hears, awesome. So you can build your life on sand or you can build your life on the rock, the rock of the word of God, the rock of truth. You see, opinion changes constantly, but truth stays the same. What was true a thousand years ago is true today and will be true in a thousand years to come. If it's true, it's true. Amen. And so we have got to build our life on the rock of the word of God, which is truth and will last forever. So that when the rogue winds of life, when the storms of life, when the difficulties of life, when the trials, the troubles, the tribulations, the difficulties, the dead ends, the disappointment, the discouragement, all the things that are inevitably going to come in life, you will be able to stand firm because of the foundation of truth from God's word in your life. You won't be blown away like Many people, uh, because they have built their life on the shifting, I call them sinking sands, of culture. Because when you build your life on what is cultural, for today, tomorrow, it's going to be different. Yes? And so I want to give you four common foundations not to build your life on. Okay? Okay? And you'll see these in, in your, uh, your outline, unreliable foundations. And the first one is, as I've mentioned, popular culture. The problem is, is what is popular today may not and probably won't be popular tomorrow. If you've lived for any length of time, you're aware that, where, that what was popular Even 50 years ago is not popular today. What was popular 40 years ago is not popular today. What was 30? Sometimes what was popular last week is not popular this week. Yeah? So in other words, some things can just go uh, so easily. So what's in style today? The clothes that you're wearing today will go out of style very quickly. What you think is cool today will someday seem old hat and uncool. Yes? And if you don't believe me, just have children. Okay? They will soon say, get with it, Dad. You know, get with the flow, because they understand 
the modern trends of things are, and of course are more susceptible than anybody to, uh, to going with popular culture. Exodus 23 and verse 2 says this. Don't follow the crowd in doing wrong. Why? Just because the crowd's doing doesn't make it right. And so often the crowd does things and we can go along with the flow of that and realize it's going in the wrong direction. And Jesus talked about that. He says you can go down the narrow path or the wide path. The wide path is many on it. There's lots of people on it. It's, uh, it's, it's open. Doesn't matter what you think, what you believe, whatever you're doing, that you can live how you like on that path, but it ends at a destination. And so you can live according to Jesus' teaching, a narrow path with certain restrictions that are going to help you and going to bless you and strengthen you, and it ends up in a different destination. And so the second thing we're not to build your life on is tradition. In other words, we've always done it that way. Yes, tradition isn't bad. You know, tradition can be very good. And the reason tradition is, 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 can be good is because it works. If you do something over and over, it becomes natural. That's why we have habits. It becomes something that we traditionally do. But the, the difference is, is tradition does not last forever. Truth does, but tradition changes. And that is what the problem is, is so often, is we can continue with traditions that are now obsolete. They're now no longer um, relevant to what we are doing. So Jesus says in Mark chapter 7 and verse 8, to a group of religious leaders, he says, you have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to the traditions of men. I don't know about you, but I know a lot of churches like that, where actually they would rather hold on to the traditions, the things that they have believed, the things of ways that they have done things, rather than actually the truth of the word of God. And so I don't want to... Uh, to pull down certain denominations. But all I'm saying is there are some that they're built on tradition, not on truth. The third thing not to build your life on is reason. You see, we all need reason. Reason is reasonable, yes. And God gives us the ability to reason. But sometimes we think because we have reasoned it out that it is right. In other words, it's I've always thought, and whatever that might be, as if that's always right, yes? But it doesn't really matter what we've always thought. What matters is what's right. What is the truth? And so when we rely on our own intellect, we can end up with a reasonable argument that ends us doing something that's incorrect, thinking something that's wrong, and making big mistakes. And then we've got to realize that reason is not infallible. Proverbs 16.25 says this, there's a way that seems right to Pastor Jonathan, but in the end, it leads to death. Put your name there. There is a way that seems right to put your name, but in the end, it leads to death. How many times have you made a decision that you thought was reasonable? You thought that it was a good thing to marry that person or get into that business or whatever it might be, you know, accept that job offer, make a certain investment. But what seemed right at the time can often be a disaster because we've gone into it with our thinking with what we think is right. But we're not always as logical as we think we are. Now, the most important one to avoid is the fourth one, and that is emotion. Some people build their life on emotion. If it feels right, I do it. If it feels wrong, I don't do it. The problem with that is feelings lie. They lie all the time to us. We think that I used to say when we first got married to Kathy, I used to say, I have a feeling in my bones. Problem was, nine times out of ten, I was wrong. 
Yes, and guess who was right? There you go. <clears throat> we lie to ourselves, and we lie to ourselves more than we do to anybody else. We say things to ourselves that are not true, and we run on emotion, what we feel like we're doing. And our feelings often tell us to do something, and often our feelings tell us that, that things are great when they're not great. And sometimes our feelings tell us things are not great, but actually they're not as bad as you think they are. And so we can go from feelings, but they are highly unreliable. We must not be manipulated by our moods. And most of what we get accomplished today in the church, in your workplace, uh, in your family, wherever it is, most of the things that get accomplished are done by people who don't feel like doing it at the time they did it. Because if we had to feel like doing it before we did it, we'd never do it, would we? So when you build your life simply on emotions, that's called immaturity. Maturity and wisdom is when you act according to your values you act according to your convictions. You act according to what is right. Judges 21, written almost 5,000 years ago, says this. At that time, there was no king in Israel, and people did whatever they felt like doing. I don't know about you, but that sounds like 2023 to me. Yes? How many people do things just because they feel like doing them? Amen. So to show you how unreasonable and unreliable their emotions, our feelings and tradition and popular culture are, to show you the difference, I want to, um, to do a little um, comparison between how Hollywood views marriage and how God views marriage. Are you ready? Okay, Hollywood's formula for relationships is this. If you want to be happy, one, what you do is you find the right person. That's what you've got to do. Then secondly, you fall madly in love with them. Then thirdly, you fix all your hopes and dreams on that person for your fulfillment in life. And then... Thirdly, fourthly, if failure occurs, you repeat steps one, two, and three. Okay? Did you get that? So you try to find the right person, fall in love, fix all your hopes and dreams on that person, and if that fails, you try again, and then you try again. But God's prescription for relationships is instead of finding the right person, you become the right person. That's a completely different uh, analogy, isn't it? You focus on building character, convictions, the right conduct, and the right conversation. You want to focus on being the right person who is worthy to be married. Secondly, instead of falling in love, you walk in love because love is a choice. Yes, it is 100% in your control. People say all the time, oh, we fell out of love. No, you didn't. You chose to stop loving because love is an action. It's a choice that you make. It's not an emotion, but oh boy, can it create some strong emotions. But it is not an emotion. Love is choosing other people's needs above our own. It's being other-centered rather than being self Centered. So we've got to become the right person. We've got to walk in love. And thirdly, we've got to fix our hope not on the other person, but on God and honor Him through our relationship. And four, if failure occurs, repeat steps one, two, and three. <laughs> You're still with me? Step one is be the right person. Step two is Walk in love. Step three is excellent. Okay, so if you want to build your life on the word of God, 
Realize it won't always be convenient. You won't always like it. It won't always be politically correct. But we need to understand if God said it, it is true. The second thing you have to do on your outline is to feed on it. Yes, you've got to feed on the Bible to get the strength that you need. The Word of God is spiritual food. The Bible describes itself as water, as milk, as bread, and as meat for our spiritual life. In other words, it's everything that we need to be strong spiritually, yes? And so we have got to be feeding ourselves if we are going to be spiritually strong, yes? You've got to eat something. What happens in the natural is in the spiritual. If you don't eat in the physical, can you imagine that, uh, that, you, you, that you're going to go for a day's work and you haven't eaten for a week? How would you be going to work? You're going to be tired, you're going to be fatigued, you're not going to be able to concentrate, there's going to be all sorts of things going on. Why? And your boss and everybody at work is going to want you to eat. Yes? All of you wives have probably realized if you want to get on the good side of your guy, make sure you've fed him. Because if he's fed, he's a happy man. Okay? Food is the way, uh, not to his stomach, but to his heart. The Bible says that we're all building and we're all in a spiritual battle. And if we're going to have success, we need to be fed. We need to be having some sustenance in us to keep us going for the battle, for the building of life. Now, the only thing that I would say is this. What I have found is, unlike natural food, that when you have eaten so much that you've had enough, what I find is the more I eat the Word of God, devour the Word of God, get the Word of God into me, the more I want. So it actually, it, it, it has that, it's, a, it's like having opal fruits. Yes? Do you remember opal fruits? In other words, it's like a, a sweet that is constantly moorish, isn't it? Salt and vinegar crisps. You have so many crisps, taste good, but you've got to have another crisp and another crisp. So it depends on how big the bag is. You don't stop till they've all gone, do you? Yes. Well, the Word of God is like that. And so the memory verse that we had for week one is Colossians 3, verse 16, which said... Excellent. Let it dwell in you. Let it inhabit you. Let it invibe every part of you. Let it in a rich profound, life-giving way. So we've got to feed ourselves. Okay, so how do we feed ourselves? We talked about this the first, uh, first week when I introduced it, is to feed on it. We need to first do it, because the Bible says faith comes through hearing the Word of God. So you hear it. How do you hear it? Well, you're doing that right now in church. You hear it whenever you hear a preacher. You can, if you read the Bible to yourself audibly, you're hearing it. Um, you know, if you're in your connect group, you can be hearing it. The problem with just receiving it with your ears is that we forget 95% of what we hear. And if you're a male, that's 105%. <laughs> Secondly, we've got to feed on the Word of God by reading it with our eyes. God gave us this book not to have on our shelf, but to have in our heart. So we've got to read it. Now again, the problem is not only does it when I read it go in one ear and often out the other, I find when I read it, it goes in one eye and comes out the other. In other words, I get so easily get distracted from what I'm reading. And so there's a third way to feed on the Word of God, which we learnt, and is we research it with our hands and with our mouth. In other words, we ask questions of the text. We write down what we see and what we're hearing. We've done that, haven't we, with the different things about personalizing it and picturing it and those kind of things. Writing it down, putting it in a journal, what God is saying to you. And through our small groups, we talked about it comes through the mouth. We share what God is, is, is speaking to us about. And as we do that, they, we are actually fed by vocalizing to other people and vice versa. Amen? So we feed ourselves by feeding one another the truth of God. Secondly, to feed yourself on the word, you've got to reflect on it. Secondly, fourthly, you've got to re re 
me numbering's gone out of pop. To feed yourself on the word, reflect on it with your mind. That's right. Spend time meditating on the word of God. In that we have learned different ways to meditate in our small groups. Yes, we've learned that, haven't we? Uh, do any of you ever talk to yourselves? We're all nuts, really, aren't we? <laughs> uh, but that's all that it is to meditate, is to keep talking to God about the Scripture. Keep talking to yourself about the Scripture for that day, about what God is saying to you. Whatever it is, just keep on mulling it over. Thirdly, feed yourself by remembering it in your heart. Memorize Scripture. Yes, we've got to do that. And so we've got to get it into our, into our life. So I want to just illustrate this uh, very much. I don't know if it's hot or cold, this water, but there we go. Now, if I have a glass of water and I have a tea bag in it, oh, that tea bag's coming apart. Got all sorts of floaters in there. I thought I only had floaters in my eyes. There you go. Now you'll see that just by reading the word or listening to the word, you know, if you're just dipping in, you're not, you're not getting a lot out of it, are you? It's not, not a lot changing, is there, in that, yeah? And so that's why the more we meditate on it, the more that, the, that as it were, like a, like a bag of tea, if you think of a bag of tea is like the word of God, the seed of the word of God, and the glass of water is like your soul, that the more that you have the word of God in you, the more the color, the flavor, the aroma is going to permeate that glass of water. And that happens in our soul. And so we need it to permeate into our soul. Amen? Thirdly, you've got to live by the word of God. Yes, third point in your outline, live by the word of God. The word of God is not only food for your soul, the word of God is your standard for living. In other words, it's the standard by which you judge everything else. It's the standard by which you make decisions. You make your decisions based on the truth of the word of God, not on the other things that we have mentioned. Amen. Psalm 1 says this, Blessed is the one who doesn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly, but who meditates on the word of God. Doesn't build his life on the counsel of the world, but builds it on the word of God. The counsel of the ungodly, that is all the stuff that we have around us. It could be people at work, it could be uh, TV, it could be social media, it could be uh, print media, uh, it could be any number of, of these things that we get our values from. They're the values of the world. But God wants us to realize that his word will give us hope when we're in a crisis. His word will comfort us when we're in despair. His word will strengthen us when we're weak. His word will give us wisdom when we're confused. His word will give us guidance when we need direction. And God's word will give us strength when we're facing temptation. Psalm 119 verse 11 says this, which uh, we have learned. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not. Amen. So that's what memorizing the Bible is about. It's about hiding it in our heart. Yes. In Matthew 4, Jesus was tempted. Yes. And we're probably familiar with that. There are three times that the devil tempts him and gives him different types of temptation. And yet Jesus only used one weapon to defend himself against the attacks of the devil. And it was the same thing every time, three occasions. It is written. It is written. That is so important. And I want to say to you, if that works for God, son Jesus... It's going to be for us to use that same weapon, but you've got to get it into your heart and into your life. You see, the issue is, is you've got to get it in and memorize it because when you need it, you usually don't have a Bible with you. 
So a friend is in a crisis, and you need to think, right, what words can I give them to comfort them? And you, if you've learned some Bible verses that can give some encouragement and some comfort, you're able to speak God's word into that situation. If you're facing temptation and you've memorized some verses about temptation, you're able to recall them. The Holy Spirit can bring them back to mind when you are doing it. Amen? But I don't know if you've noticed something with this. And this is one of the weaker ones of the tea bags. In fact, I don't know if I can use that one. It's not very good, is it? Yeah. Uh, but anyway, just because of the floaters, somebody's... Uh, oh, that's got floaters in as well. I think it's to do with that. Somebody. Anyway, but one thing that you do is, as, it, as the more it goes in there, what happens with it? What's changed about it now? Yeah? If it didn't have the floaters in it, okay. It's now no longer a glass of water. It is now a glass of tea. That's what it is. And it is, I don't know what type it is. I've lost the packet. There you go. But it's now, in other words, its identity has changed. When you allow the word of God to soak into your life, to meditate it, to receive it, to listen to it, to read it, to research it, to get it into your heart and life, ask some questions of the text, picture it, and, and get all that into your life and memorize it, I want to say to you, it will change your identity. It, you, will be, you will no longer be just what you were, but what is in you will change you. You will become a child of God. You will become a disciple and the more Christ-like as time goes on so that your identity is being transformed as the word of Christ is in you, just like the tea bag is transforming the glass of water for that water to never be the same again. Yes. And so we've got to have that. We're going to have the word of God in us. We will have the flavor of Christ. We will have the aroma of Christ. We will have the, the, the character of Christ in us as we allow his word. Fourthly, we need to grow through it. As I said, the Bible is often referred to as a seed. It's planted in your heart. If it finds good soil, it grows and it produces fruit. No root, no fruit. And God wants us, as I talked about the other week, as all to be uh, um, fruitful in what we are doing. So he wants us to, to grow through it. And so just quickly go through the parable of the four soils, yes? And the four soils that, uh, that he talked about, this is, is based on our week two memory verse, which is Psalm 119, verse 18, which is open I'm impressed, I'm impressed. There you go. So there's lots of wonderful things in the Bible to see, but you're not going to see them unless God opens your eyes to them. So you've got to be receptive, yes? That's what you've got to do. So the first type of soil, and the soil represents our heart, the seed represents the word of God, is so often people's hearts are hard. They're closed to the things of God. So if, you, if you're talking to somebody and their mind is closed to the things of God, it doesn't matter what you do, it is not going to do that. Now, let's say I had some cold water in here. I only have hot. But anyway, if I had some cold water and I put that tea bag in, how much do you think that tea bag is going to be? It will eventually come out, but it's going to take a long time, isn't it? Yes? So in other words, when, when your heart is cold, when your heart is closed, you're not going to receive the word of God into your life. The second one is shallow soil. In other words, a superficial uh, soil, yes? Um, a superficial mind. In other words, we go to church, we hear the sermon, but we don't do anything about it. By the time we've got to the car park, we've forgotten what Jonathan was talking about or anybody else, and it's gone. We didn't really take time for it to sink in. And so what is the action step if you want uh, to be able to, um, uh, to, to uh, you know, not have a superficial, shallow mind is to make time for God's word. 
Amen. So the first one is hardened soil, gives you a closed mind. The action is to cultivate an open mind. The second one is the shallow soil, is a superficial mind. And the action is to make time for God's word. And the third type of soil is weeds, which is a preoccupied uh, mind. In other words, it's busyness. And I think this is probably number one out of many people that I know. Uh, most people are just busy, 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 busy. And that busyness means that their life has got lots of weeds in. The busyness, the distractions of life, the other things that are vying for your attention, they are weeds in your life. And we have got to eliminate the unnecessary stuff, live a simplified life, reduce things down so that we can focus and allow the Word of God to seep into us, into every aspect of it. So we, the action is to eliminate the distractions. Fourthly, the good soil. That is a willing mind. Amen? That's, uh, that's, that's when you're really saying, yes, Lord, what is it you want me to do? Lord, I might not understand it. I, don't, I, don't, I can't explain it, but I know, Lord, you've told me this is the truth, so I'm going to walk in it. I'm going to do it. That's having a, a, a willing mind. And of course, when that, the word of God just gets planted into you, into your life, then of course, you're going to cooperate with what the Bible says. Amen. And then the fifth thing we've got to do is to act on it, yes, which is the cooperating with what it, it means, yes. And the Bible verse that we memorized in week three applies to this. James chapter one and verse 22. Do not... Amen. Excellent. So as I've said previously... We only believe the parts that we actually do. So if there's parts of Scripture that you're not doing, you don't actually believe it, yes? You are a practical atheist with regard to that. And so we've got to do it. And that's why over the last six weeks, in our small groups, we have been looking at the different methods of just being able to paraphrase it and to picture it you know, and just to be able to put yourself there in, in place of it, you know, put the, in place of the pronouns and nouns, just to be able to put yourself in there, yes? And so we do all that, why? So that we can um, uh, ingrain the Word of God into our lives, amen? And, uh, and so we've got to act on it. So we've looked at them, you've got them there in your, in your thing. Um, I, I don't know if you, have you, many of you got a hang of the space pets? yes. Um, I use probe steps, but it's uh, virtually the, the same and, uh, and really worthwhile doing that. So we're going we're gonna to learn the, the last one this week. And sixthly, we need to trust in it. And uh, that's Psalm 119, verse 105, which is our memory verse for this week, which is, your word is uh, to my feet and uh, amen. So let me ask you a question. Are you ever in the dark? Ever in the dark about something? You know, sometimes we're in a situation where we think, I haven't got the slightest idea what to do next or what decision to make or how I should proceed or how I can do this. Or I don't really know whether I should accept this job offer. I don't know whether I should go to this college or this university. And we've got that and we're just kind of indecision and we, we feel in the dark. We feel confused. That's when we need Light. If ever you're in the dark, what do you need? You need a light, you need a torch, you need something, don't you? And so if ever you're feeling in the dark, feeling confused, not knowing what to do, get your torch out, the Word of God, because it is your light for your life. Amen. And you've got to realize God will always keep his promise. So you might say to yourself, Lord, I'm in this situation, I don't know what decision to make. But Lord, I know that you have promised in your word that your word is a light unto my path, a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And so therefore I'm trusting in that. So as I now, as I read your word, as I listen to your word, as I just, um, you know, ask some questions of the text as I'm reading this, Lord, and uh, I'm discussing it with my small group and I'm hearing it on Sunday. Lord, speak to me so that it lights up the path that I should be taking. Amen. That's what we need to do. So <clears throat> I want to challenge you. Challenge you to keep on keeping on. To keep on 
with your Bible reading, to keep on attending your small group and connecting in there and being part of it, not just turning up, but really getting connected in. Coming on Sundays, um, you know, and just that whole aspect, making sure that daily devotions, weekly just withdrawing to spend time with God and God's people, and, uh, and even putting into your schedule annual retreats to just spend time with God. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we have your word. We thank you, Lord, for this past six weeks that we have been able to have a glimpse, Lord Jesus, of the power of your word. We thank you, Lord, that when we read your word, we are able to read of the many people and the things that they did and the choices that they made and how it impacted their life. And so, Lord, we realize that they are our mentors. We thank you, Lord, for giving us mentors that, Lord Jesus, that we can look to and see, Lord Jesus, their life and the decisions that they made and how it impacted them. I pray, Lord, that we would truly, Lord Jesus, have the word of God developing in our heart, in our mind. So that, Lord, that we will be like that, that glass of water, that we're just sucking up, Lord Jesus, everything, Lord, from the seed of your word. That, Lord, that we take on, Lord Jesus, your aroma. We take on, Lord Jesus, your, your character. We take on, Lord Jesus, your love and your joy and your peace. We take on, Lord, who you are, an identity becomes a Christ-like identity. We pray in Jesus' lovely name. If today you've never given your life to Jesus, then just pray something simple. Heavenly Father, today I want to give my life to you. I recognize I've not been living according to your plan. I've not been uh, reading your word. I've done things according to what I thought's best or what other people have advised me. I pray today, Lord, that you would just help me to, Lord, to love you with all my heart. I ask you today to take away my sin, to forgive me for doing things my way. And help me, Lord, from this day on, Lord, to do, Lord, what is on your heart, what is your will, and to obey your word. Lord, I pray for that, Lord. Help me to soak it in so that, Lord, that I am changed from the inside out. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.